November the 3rd, Ezekiel 7, 1 through 9, 11. This further message came to me from God. Tell Israel, wherever you look, east, west, north or south, your land is finished. No hope remains, for I will loose my anger on you for your worshipping of idols. I will turn my eyes away and show no pity. I will repay you in full, and you shall know I am the Lord. The Lord God says, with one blow after another I will finish you. The end has come. Your final doom is waiting. O oh, Israel, the day of your damnation dawns. The time has come. The day of trouble nears. It is a day of shouts of anguish, not shouts of joy. Soon I will pour out my fury and let it finish its work of punishing you for all your evil deeds. I will not spare nor pity you, and you will know that I, the Lord, am doing it. The day of judgment has come. The morning dawns, for your wickedness and pride have run their course and reached their climax. None of these rich and wicked men of pride shall live. All your boasting will die away, and no one will be left to bewail your fate. Yes, the time has come. The day draws near. There will be nothing to buy or sell, for the wrath of God is on the land. And even if a merchant lives, his business will be gone, for God has spoken against all the people of Israel. All will be destroyed. Not one of those whose lives are filled with sin will recover. The trumpets shout to Israel's army, Mobilize! But no one listens, for my wrath is on them all. If you go outside the walls, there stands the enemy to kill you. If you stay inside, famine and disease will devour you. Any who escape will be lonely as mourning doves hiding on the mountains, each weeping for his sins. All hands shall be feeble, and all knees as weak as water. You shall clothe yourselves with sackcloth, and horror and shame shall cover you. You shall shave your heads in sorrow and remorse. Throw away your money, toss it out like worthless rubbish, for it will have no value in the day of wrath. It will neither satisfy nor feed you, for your love of money is the reason for your sin. I gave you gold to use in decorating the temple, and you used it instead to make idols. Therefore I will take it all away from you. I will give it to foreigners and to wicked men as booty. They shall defile my temple. I will not look when they defile it, nor will I stop them. Like robbers they will loot the treasures and leave the temple in ruins. Prepare chains for my people, for the land is full of bloody crimes. Jerusalem is filled with violence, so I will enslave her people. I will crush your pride by bringing to Jerusalem the worst of the nations to occupy your homes, break down your fortifications you are so proud of, and defile your temple. For the time has come for the cutting off of Israel. You will sue for peace, but you won't get it. Calamity upon calamity will befall you. Woe upon woe, disaster upon disaster. You will long for a prophet to guide you, but the priests and elders and the kings and princes will stand helpless, weeping in despair. The people will tremble with fear, for I will do to them the evil they have done, and give them all their just deserts. They shall learn that I am the Lord. Then, late in August of the sixth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, as I was talking with the elders of Judah in my home, the power of the Lord God fell upon me. I saw what appeared to be a man. From his waist down, he was made of fire. From his waist up, he was all amber-colored brightness. He put out what seemed to be a hand and took me by the hair. And the Spirit lifted me up into the sky and seemed to transport me to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate, where the large idol was that had made the Lord so angry. Suddenly, the glory of the God of Israel was there, just as I had seen it before in the valley. He said to me, Son of dust, look toward the north. So I looked, and sure enough, north of the altar gate in the entrance stood the idol. And he said, Son of dust, do you see what they are doing? Do you see what great sins the people of Israel are doing here to push me from my temple? But come, and I will show you greater sins than these. Then he brought me to the door of the temple court, where I made out an opening in the wall. Now dig into the wall. I did, and uncovered a door to a hidden room. Go on in, and see the wickedness going on in there. So I went in. The walls were covered with pictures of all kinds of snakes, lizards, and hideous creatures, besides all the various idols worshipped by the people of Israel. Seventy elders of Israel were standing there along with Jehazaniah, son of Shaphan, worshipping the pictures. Each of them held a censer of burning incense, so there was a thick cloud of smoke above their heads. Then the Lord said to me, Son of dust, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in their minds? For they say, The Lord doesn't see us. He has gone away. Come and I will show you greater sins than these. He brought me to the north gate of the temple, and there 
set women weeping for Tammuz, their god. Have you seen this? But I will show you greater evils than these. Then he brought me into the inner court of the temple, and there at the door, between the porch and the bronze altar, were about twenty-five men standing with their backs to the temple of the Lord, facing east, worshipping the sun. Have you seen this? Is it nothing to the people of Judah that they commit these terrible sins, leading the whole nation into idolatry, thumbing their noses at me and arousing my fury against them? Therefore I will deal with them in fury. I will neither pity nor spare, and though they scream for mercy, I will not listen. Then he thundered. Call those to whom I have given the city. Tell them to bring their weapons with them. Six men appeared at his call, coming from the upper north gate, each one with his sword. One of them wore linen clothing and carried a rider's case strapped to his side. They all went into the temple and stood beside the bronze altar. And the glory of the God of Israel rose from the cherubim, where it had rested and stood above the entrance to the temple. And the Lord called to the man with the rider's case and said to him, Walk through the streets of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who weep and sigh because of all the sins they see around them. Then I heard the Lord tell the other men, Follow him through the city and kill everyone whose forehead isn't marked. Spare not nor pity them. Kill them all, old and young girls, women and little children. But don't touch anyone with the mark and begin right here at the temple. And so they began by killing the seventy elders. Defile the temple. Fill its courts with the bodies of those you kill. Go. And they went out through the city and did as they were told. While they were fulfilling their orders, I was alone. I fell to the ground on my face and cried out, O Lord God, will your fury against Jerusalem wipe out everyone left in Israel? The sins of the people of Israel and Judah are very great. And all the land is full of murder and injustice, for they say, The Lord doesn't see it. He has gone away. And so I will not spare them, nor have any pity on them. And I will fully repay them for all that they have done. Just then, the man in the linen clothing, carrying the writer's case, reported back and said, I have finished the work you gave me to do. Hebrews 5, 1 through 14. The Jewish high priest is merely a man like anyone else but he has chosen to speak for all other men in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers to him the blood of animals that are sacrificed to cover the sins of the people and his own sins too. And because he is a man, he can deal gently with other men, though they are foolish and ignorant. For he too is surrounded with the same temptations and understands their problems very well. Another thing to remember is that no one can be a high priest just because he wants to be. He has to be called by God for this work in the same way God chose Aaron. That is why Christ did not elect himself to the honor of being high priest. No, he was chosen by God. God said to him, My son, today I have honored you. And another time God said to him, You have been chosen to be a priest forever with the same rank as Melchizedek. Yet while Christ was here on earth, he pleaded with God, praying with tears and agony of soul to the only one who would save him from premature death. And God heard his prayers because of his strong desire to obey God at all times. And even though Jesus was God's son, he had to learn from experience what it was like to obey, when obeying meant suffering. It was after he had proved himself perfect in this experience that Jesus became the giver of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. For remember that God had chosen him to be a high priest with the same rank as Melchizedek. There is much more I would like to say along these lines, but you don't seem to listen, so it's hard to make you understand. You have been Christians a long time now, and you ought to be teaching others. But instead, you have dropped back to the place where you need someone to teach you all over again the very first principles in God's Word. You are like babies who can drink only milk, not old enough for solid food. And when a person is still living on milk, it shows he isn't very far along in the Christian life and doesn't know much about the difference between right and wrong. He is still a baby Christian. You will never be able to eat solid spiritual food and understand the deeper things of God's word until you become better Christians and learn right from wrong by practicing doing right. Proverbs for today, 26, 28. Flattery is a form of hatred and wounds cruelly. 